So welcome everybody. Good to have you aboard for another week. Obviously, we've covered um, the initial week. We um, covered some a &R stuff. Then we covered some management stuff. And last week, um, or last week we covered the management stuff, actually, I think. Um, but week four, we, I wanted to give you a bit of an insight into um, a little bit of the business side of music. And it's really important, I think, that everybody understands the the business side, not necessarily um, inside out, but this is where you all get paid. This is where um, you get frustrated at not having money or not understanding why something hasn't happened or you don't understand a royalty statement. And I think some basics is really good for everybody to kind of get around. So my name's John Course. If you don't know me already, I'm one of the partners in Vicious Recording, started the label, obviously, very long time ago now with Andy Van, who is online, but I've got him on mute, so he can just wave. Um, but um, yeah, we started the label a very long time ago and basically through trial and error, um, have learned a lot along the way. And I handle all of the business affairs for the label now. So I deal with most of the contract related stuff. I oversee the royalties with our accounts department. So I'm aiming to give you some insight. I've got my whiteboard behind me, which is gonna provide some help uh, it's a very rudimentary way to do it, but I didn't want to get stuck down with kind of trying to post spreadsheets and stuff in the actual chat because it could get a little bit confusing and hopefully this will be pretty straightforward. So what I'm going to start talking about initially, I'm going to cover contracts, copyright, and also royalties. But initially, I'm going to just discuss contracts a little bit. So firstly, there's a billion different things that can be standard in a contract. And, um, you know, People often ask me, you know, what's a good deal? What's a bad deal? I mean, at the end of the day, a good deal is one that you're comfortable with. And I think sometimes people get caught up on the little bits and pieces, but, you know, obviously on a basic level, a huge artist is in a position to get potentially a better deal than you're going to get as a new artist um, because they've potentially got an audience that they already bring to the table they've potentially got a profile, they've potentially got Spotify followers already. You know, obviously, if you look at a prime example, Calvin Harris versus somebody that's never had a record out, is Calvin Harris gonna get a better deal than the guy's never had a record out? Yeah, he probably is. And that's obvious as to why, but the same principles apply even on a lower level. So, you know, there's a few different ways that you can um, see, see a deal and what it can look like. From a technical point of view, in my experience, I've seen three different, three or four different sorts of deals. Um, only three that I'd really recommend anybody do. Um, I've seen straight buyout deals where you can sell your music and never have a stake in it in the future. I don't think that's a good idea. And certainly I've never done it with any music that I've been involved with. And I would recommend that you don't do it either. Um, you could have a very small share in a song that gets very big and it could earn you a lot of money. So I think even if you do want to do a, a deal where you sell a song to somebody as a producer and you hand it over to them to, to deal with from that point forward, I think it's still a good idea to keep a share in the, both the writing and the, uh, and the, and the master if you can, because you've been part of it. Um, depends on who it is, of course, but I would recommend don't do a straight up buyout deal. The other sorts of deals are things called a PPD deal. PPD stands for Publish Price to Dealer. It's a bit of an old school way that labels used to work in that your royalty was based on whatever the record store paid for the CD. So a CD single might have been $3 on, off the shelf at Sanity or JBI, and it would have sold to JB Hi-Fi for maybe $1.20, and your royalty would be based on that $1.20 PPD price. Um, not as much of that around now because obviously we're in a digital world and there's downloads and streaming. So I think most deals generally work around a percentage and that percentage can be, um, you know, based on um, anything probably between about 25% and 50%. But it's really a little bit irrelevant what the percentage is if you don't understand what the costs that are going to come out and going to be what's called recouped against you. And by re recouped, what we mean in the music industry is the label may pay for something, 
but or the publisher may pay for something, but it'll be recoupable out of your future income before you get paid. Sometimes things are recoupable off the top of a deal. So a recording cost, for instance, may be recoupable off the very top of a deal. Other times it may be recoupable only off your share. And there's no right or wrong to do with this. Lots of deals are different and different things are recoupable against you. I think the only thing you have to make sure you know is that if something is recoupable only against you, as opposed to being a cost off the top, which means it gets paid for by the record label and you before there's a royalty, the difference is if it's only recoupable against you, you need to understand what it is. And you need to have, I think, some say over what it is. Because as an example, somebody could get a remixer that costs $10,000 and it could be their mate. And that remixer could put an invoice in for $15,000. And it could be recoupable against you only as an artist, which means if the record makes $30,000 profit and you're in a 50-50 profit share, the label gets 15 grand and 15 grand goes to you. Oh, but wait a minute. We just paid the remix of 15 grand and it's 100% recoupable against you as an artist. So my mate, the remix had just got 15 grand. My label got 15 grand and you as an artist got nothing. That's just an example of when something's only recoupable against the artist that you have to be aware of what the cost is and have some approval over it. In that same example, if it was recoupable of both the label and the artist, there's $30,000 of profit, the remix costs 15 grand, there's 15 grand left over, seven and a half goes to the label, seven and a half goes to the artist. So straight away you can see that the artist, sorry, the label doesn't have a vested interest and can't be doing something dodgy because it's affecting their money as well. So it's a really good distinctive thing to understand about, um, about your costs. Um, you know, overall, I've found some countries can be much harsher to deal with. Um, certainly the USA can be super bullish about how they do things. I think there's a couple of reasons why. They can be very tough in terms of your royalty rate. And that's partly because it's a huge territory and it's very hard to break music in there. As an example, a DJ promo campaign in Australia can cost $2,000. In the US, it can cost $30,000 can cost even more. A radio campaign can cost $100,000. That's before you've even got really any huge level of success. So that's one reason. But I think another reason that deals, particularly out of America, can be really harsh is because I think the US just has a, a business mentality that it's kind of dog eat dog. And if they can take advantage of a new person on the scene and get a deal where you got a 10% royalty and you sign that deal, they're like, bad luck, we, we got the deal done and, and you're just stuck on the receiving end of it. So I think there's, I mean, it's a, it is a generalization, but I think particularly with deals hailing out of the US, you have to be really careful about what the rate's like, how those rates spread out to other territories around the world and what sort of things they're making recoupable and not recoupable. Um, because sometimes what's recoupable and not recoupable can actually affect your deal even more than really your percentage because you end up paying for absolutely everything. Um, and as a general rule, I think the best sorts of deals really are, um, are profit share deals because you see everything that gets spent and you can understand kind of what's going on um, with the bulk of the music. I mean, as far as publishing deals go, you know, there's a point where you, you need one and I think their rates are generally going to be around 25% that goes to the publisher, 75% to the writers. Um, that can vary a little bit. And certainly there's other areas of publishing where it plays a part. It might be sync or it might be sheet music. Um, things like that will potentially have different rates. Um, we did discuss managers briefly last week. But again, I'll just touch on that. Management percentages generally around the 20% mark is a reasonable, I'm just going to let somebody into this room. Yeah, generally managers around the 20% mark, it can be higher, it can be lower. Certainly in my experience, I have crossed paths with managers who've been paid, rumoured a lot more. 
Um, they certainly did an outstanding job for the person I've got in my head. <laughs> and I'm sure Andy knows who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say. Um, but um, I think around the 20% mark is a reasonable starting point, depending on what they bring to the table. You know, having said all that about percentages, the single most important thing about any deal is just who you're doing the deal with. You have to make sure that um, the people that you're bringing into your team are people that you like and they're gonna bring the right things to the table. And just as an example, you know, like, um, you've just gotta make sure that any agreements reflect what you want in a deal. And that could be different for different people. Some people might want money. Some people might want, you know, opportunity. Some people might want assistance making music. Some people might want a network of singers. Some people might want a great sync connection with a publishing company. Um, all those things are important, but you need to ask some questions about what you're trying to get and what you're trying to achieve. The same way we touched on management last week. What's your end goal? even if it's six months, 12 months, two years, five years, and how do you get there and who are you going to partnership with to help you get there? Um, as a label, some questions, you know, do they bring great A&R skills? Is that something I want? Do I want feedback on my music from experienced people? I mean, personally, I think single-handedly A&R can turn an average record into a great record and potentially a great record into a hit because Great A&R gives great feedback to improve your songs. And I think it's an essential part of a good label. And even if you don't have a label and you're releasing completely independent, a trusted ear is really important. But also what networks to labels, publishers, managers bring to the table? What experience do they have? Who are they distributed by? And where can they get your music? Um, you know, do they have a good reputation? Firstly, for dealing with artists, because we're all gonna butt heads on, on things. Creative people butt heads, that's just how the world works. And when you butt heads, is it in a productive, let's get this shit done? Or is it in a negative way, affects whether you wanna even make music with somebody? And I'm sure many of you have been in collaborations with people and some of them have been amazing. And some of them you've been like, wow, this really, doesn't work for me. And the same thing applies to labels. And of course, you know, labels, managers, publishers, are they reputable? Will they pay me when we make money? If there is a profit, do I ever see it? These are some of the questions, you know, I think you should be asking. You should be asking of managers, of publishers, of labels, but you also, also should be asking of touring agents and even lawyers, because lawyers are negotiating on your behalf but they're a business and you're paying them and they can be super expensive. Some of you may have experienced this already, but I really think ask some questions about any lawyer that's going to represent you with other people they've represented and see whether they felt like they got a fair deal and a good deal because a lot of negotiation can be done between people that are knowledgeable and you don't need a lawyer until you need to draft something that reflects that conversation. Just got somebody coming into the, into the room here. So I think that's an important kind of thing to, to understand as well. Um, that's kind of the basics of my, my vibes on contracts. I mean, they're important. Hopefully you negotiate one, you deal with the details and you never have to look at it again. Certainly on a creative level, sometimes you might have to check what your royalty is or what should be recouped or what shouldn't be recouped. But I think a good contract is done filed away and stays there until every record's delivered because that means you've got a great working relationship with your artists and the people you work with. I think in the history of Vicious, I mean, we've released over 800 records. We've probably had a contractual fight twice and one of them was Avicii. Um, and that was just, I guess, his management being very bullish um, towards the end of his deal with us. And, you know, sometimes that stuff happens and it doesn't mean it's a completely negative thing. It's just, you know, two people looking at things from slightly different angles. But I think a good contract is a deal that reflects the things that you find important. Um, there's things that labels will find important. There's things that artists will find important. They don't always gel exactly.
but there is a middle ground there. And I think it's about finding that in a, in a way that doesn't get too bullheadish and argumentative. And certainly as a commitment, whether it be to a manager, a publisher, a label, if you're not willing to make a commitment, they're not gonna commit to you back. So it's really important to consider, even though you're not on the other side of the equation, why is a manager gonna manage you for two months and not get paid at the start because that's when you're not earning much money or four months or six months. And then you start to grow and two years later, the management deal finishes and, and you're bigger than you've ever been and, and they're still got hardly anything. You've got to think about the commitment that they're making, that labels make financially, that publishers make to build your songwriting skills and your songwriting network and balance that against your freedom as a songwriter or an artist or, you know, uh, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, just let me have a quick little sip of this drink. So that's the basics that I want to let everybody know about contracts. Um, and again, look, this is just my perspective. It is by no means gospel. And I certainly think that, um, you know, it's always great to get third party advice regarding agreements, whether it be from a trusted source whether it be from a consultant that you pay, or whether it be from a lawyer, obviously those three things go up in value. So um, it can get expensive if every single thing you run by is a paid lawyer at two, three, four hundred dollars an hour. Um, I'm going to go on about royalties towards the end and and how they work and, and where the structure and, and where they're paid from and how. But it's very hard to discuss royalties without everybody having a really, really clear understanding of copyright. Because copyright is what generates the royalty. So I'm going to go through some copyright stuff. And this is where my uh, trusty whiteboard is going to come in to play behind me, which I have here. So um, I was going to try and do this all digitally with with um, pictures on screen, but it's a little tricky to work that out on Zoom. So we're going old school. So I hope that you can read what I have on that screen. Um, do you wanna just give me a wave if you can read those top two here? This one says composition. This one here says sound recording. And they are basically the two rights that is in every musical work. And just to explain a little bit, um, Every single song has two copyrights and they are composition and sound recording. So the composition, um, anything that a writer composes with or without lyrics results in a composition. And that is often referred to as a musical work. Um, uh, a work is written, even if it's written down as musical notes on a piece of paper, like a score, it may never have been played, but if you're skillful enough to write down your music out of your head, like a, classical composer like Bach or Beethoven would have, um, and then see it get played, um, that has a copyright. And that copyright happens straight away. However, you should be registering your music as a composer with your Performing Rights Association. And in Australia, that is APRA. Um, in the UK, it's PRS, stands for Performing Rights Society. In Australia, it stands for Australia Performing Rights Association. Um, that not only helps give some legitimacy to when you wrote the song, because obviously when you register it, it's, it's recorded, but also it gives it a, a timestamp. And it also, uh, as you'll see, once we go through the royalty streams, it's where you get paid from and it's how it identifies music. So if you're not part of APRA and you're writing music, absolutely get online, join them and start registering your songs as they come up. Um, you'll also, uh, there's two people could theoretically write the same song at the same time. And, you know, if you had yours registered on the 1st of January, as an example, 2019 and my version, I've never heard your version, but I write the same chords in my song in March, 2019 and mine becomes a massive hit. If you've registered that song, first and it's got the same chords it's going to be you who ultimately can go and say hey i wrote those chords even if the other song the person might say well i never heard your version 
it doesn't matter because you've registered your version first and it's got that melody in it and you can never prove when somebody else could have heard that melody. If it's a release song, they could have been sitting in the back of a car, heard it, stuck in their head. They write the same chords two months later. They register it two months later. It blows up to be a massive hit. Did they actually write those chords or did they hear them in the back of the car off, off your version and that's where the chord come from? So, you know, music copyright works in that way. So you need to make sure that you register your music. Um, so that's one side. The other side is a sound recording right. And every time there's a new composition, sorry, every time there's a recording of a new composition, there's a new sound recording born. So they're sometimes called a master, a master recording. And I think that's due to them being finished um, kind of recordings. They've got that kind of nickname. These masters are what artists, you know, eventually burn to CDs or they sign them to labels or they get uploaded to iTunes, Spotify, other places for streaming. Um, a really important distinction is that um, one composition can have multiple sound recordings. So take Yesterday by the Beatles. It's believed to be the most covered song in the history of music. There's over 2,200 cover versions of Yesterday by the Beatles. And Artists like Liberace, you know, Elvis Presley, En Vogue, Boys to Men have all done cover versions of, um, of Yesterday by the Beatles. So it still only has one composition, uh, but it has obviously over 2,200 sound recording masters. So there's 2,200 or more rights on one side, and there's still only one composition right on the other side. There's still two rights in every version of that song, the only difference is that 2,200 of them are going to be credited to the Beatles and paid through them as the composers of the song. And the other 2,200 are going to be sound performances that could be with labels, with, with, um, with master rights holders, etc. So the important thing to remember is that there's composition, goes into a sound recording. That's the, the absolute basic um, kind of rules. But after that, and I'll do my little reveal here. Very technical stuff. It's very high tech. We have both sides can be split into, into two different areas. And they are the composition side can be split to the writer and to a publisher. And the sound recording side can be split to an artist and a record label. Um, you know, there's a lot of symmetry between the two different rights that are in music. And often in one side, there'll be a bunch of people who deal with the sound recording rights, but there'll be a kind of matching pair for the composition rights. And quite often like this, it's, you know, for every one that's happening on a composition side, there's somebody doing a similar job on the master right side. So that's the basic four places that we start off with. Um, you know, obviously, um, uh, if you're, um, sorry, I've just got some notes here that I've got in the back background. So yeah, if something exists for the composition, it probably exists in some way for the sound recording as well. Um, if you're a solo indie songwriter, then you're both, you're both of these things, you're the writer and the publisher. Um, and on the sound recording, um, the artist and the performer are the main stakeholders. But if you're a solo independent performer, you could be all of these things. But you still should think of them as different rights because that's how money gets collected in the future. And you'll, when you see this whole income stream that I've got on this whiteboard, you'll understand. And that's how most people deal with it. So it's important that even if you are one of these things, you know, when you're an artist sitting in your room, you have no record deal, you've written one song, you're a, you're a composer. When you finish that song, you're now a composer and a sound recording owner. When you sign that song to a label, you're now the artist, you're, the, um, you're no longer the record label, but you've signed a part of it to the record label, so you're now the artist. And if you have a publisher, you're signing to the publisher, but you're still the writer. 
So these things get divided up with different stakeholders, but you should think of them um, as different parts of the, uh, of the process. Generally, a publisher will own the rights in the publishing that they've signed off you, and a record label will own the rights in the um, sound recording or the audio master. Now, look, I'm excluding live concert type touring, income, um, merchandise income, income from being a remixer. That really has nothing to do with the royalty streams generally, and you're not getting paid those things from any one particular label. That's all kind of third party stuff. Obviously, touring can be very lucrative, but we're not going over that now in terms of, of kind of royalty. So I'm just discussing the primary stakeholders who have an interest in the business of releasing music, the writer, publisher, artist, record label. Now, obviously, these can be further divided as well because there can be multiple writers. If you write a song with another person that's published by the same company, then you'll have the same publisher. But if you write a song with somebody that's published by a different publisher, you'll have two writers, you'll have two publishers. Um, you could also collaborate and have a singer. So you can have two artists and that singer could be signed to a different record label. So you could theoretically also have two record labels that have to deal with it. So keep that in mind as well. Obviously, um, you know, there can also be co-producers or performers that take a stake in either share. Somebody could co-write it and sing on it and they will take a share of the, of the sound record and they'll just get a share of whatever your record deal is if they don't have a record deal. Um, the deals you have with a label or a publisher if you're self-released with somebody like Bandcamp is what outlines what portion of royalties they, they collect and should be shared with you and what costs or recruitment should come out of that. So, you know, this is where it goes back to the contracts that I started out with. Depending on what is in those um, agreements with your various deals that you do determines what kind of rate you get for all of these things. Um, and that's how it kind of pans out on a practical sense. Um, you know, um, but you should always think of music as, as four separate entities once you've signed it, obviously. Um, even if you wrote, published and released on Bandcamp, then you're the you're everything, but as your career grows, you know, the business is basically divided, 99% of the time it's divided like this, and that's how you should think about it. Um, the revenue that comes into this, because at the moment we just have music going out, the revenue that comes into this, I have down the bottom here, and I've labeled it services, and I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit, I've labelled it services and as you can see we've got record label sound recordings going into services and we've got sound recording royalties going out of services into the record label and they also go over here to the publisher um, in the port which I'll get to in a second but so for the sake of this services radio stores traditional stores, iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, Fox FM. In Australia, radio stations pay fees to play music. Um, they do in most of the world. Unfortunately, in the biggest market in the world, America, terrestrial radio does not pay to play music. Um, they have negotiated that it's promotional a long time ago and that's never changed. Um, JB Hi-Fi, et cetera. And the money comes into the services in one of three ways, investors, so investors could invest in um, iTunes or Spotify. Um, customers who are obviously buying music, who are um, streaming music, um, who are listening to the radio and advertising, which also comes in. So as an example, on the, um, on the Spotify free tier, there's ads placed every kind of three songs and that ad revenue goes into a giant pool that gets distributed based on what is being streamed. Um, a similar thing happens with YouTube, Facebook, and many other places. There's lots of free models. And obviously a subscriber model is a paid model. And that is a customer, that is a customer revenue coming into the Spotify or coming into the iTunes store and a royalty going, as we see here, a sound recording royalty going to the record label. And there is a royalty flowing over here to the writers, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so how does your music 
get from the record label to Spotify. Well, in between all of that, there is also, and I'll get my little, uh, my little, I'll rip some more pages off my very, very high tech screen over here. And you'll see that over here, we have DSPs. Now, DSPs are basically partners who join in this collective along the way. Um, digital service providers and most labels have them. Examples of them are TuneCore, CD Baby, Ingrooves, Prime, Fuga, AMA, the Zalon here in Australia. Um, you can just only imagine how many services, and by that I mean down the bottom here, services there are in the world. Um, there are literally thousands of stores in the world that release music, even digitally. Um, there's obviously the ones we know like iTunes and Google, Apple, but also as an example in Asia, there's Alibaba and there's a company called Tencent, which is absolutely massive. There's huge ones in India, Russia. Um, if we didn't have a DSP as a label, we would have to do deals with every single digital retailer that there is individual contracts of 20, 30 pages. Not only that, we'd have to upload the master, the artwork, the label copy to every single store individually, which you can imagine would be a ridiculously huge job. And this is where DSPs step into the picture because the label does a deal with the DSP. The DSP is acting on behalf of thousands of labels and they already have deals or are doing deals with the um, services like Spotify, Apple, and all of the thousands of others. So now we can upload our music via one deal to a DSP and the DSP can deliver that music to all of the services. And the DSP is getting a share of whatever the cut is. There can also be multiple DSPs because for instance, you might have a DSP that's really great in Europe, but they don't know the Japanese market. So that DSP will do a deal with a DSP in, in Japan and that Japan DSP will then distribute your music um, to all of the best Japanese services and stores. Um, they generally take a percentage or a flat fee and they're part of the food chain of where music comes from. So we, we all with us, just give us a wave. Everybody got this covered so far? <laughs> It's, it's, it's a little intense, but I mean, it's kind of straightforward once you get your head around it. The things that come into play now are very important and they are called performing rights societies. I've got one here for sound recording and I've got one over here for composition performance rights. Um, and they are basically performance rights organisations that collect your royalties due to you when your compositions and sound recordings are performed as opposed to being sold. Um, for the composition in Australia, the organisation that looks after it is APRA. And as I said before, when I said you should be registering your songs with APRA, this is how you get paid for your composition being performed. The one that looks after the other right, and as I said, there's usually two rights in Australia is PPCA, which stands for... Um, Actually, I don't have it written down there, but it's uh, Public Performance Copyright Association or Public Performance Copyright Australia, one of those two. Um, and they provide licenses to Australian businesses to play recorded music in the public. Uh, they're a non-profit and their net, their net um, fees are distributed to record labels and registered Australian artists who create the recordings. Um, the USA have a few different ones. One of them is Sound Exchange, was probably the mo most prominent. The interesting thing is that basically 99% of the territories have a PRO for both the composition and the sound recording. So there's an equivalent agency to APRA in Germany, the US, you know, the UK, Holland, wherever you go. And the same, there's an equivalent agency of PPCA that are out there doing stuff. So you should be signed up with your own local agency and you should make sure that your songs are registered um, for, for, both, for both rights. As you can see off the drawing, they sit here and I'll just do a quick um, rundown of these arrows. Performance royalties 
from services flow out and into the sound recording PRO and they pay the rights holder, but they also, um, when you register as an artist, they also pay the artist. And on this side, there's also a royalty for performance royalties that flows from the same place and it goes to the composition um, PRO. And again, you register as a publisher, you register as a writer, and the royalty flows to both the writer and the publisher from the composition PRO. So being registered on both those things has a direct result in you gaining income and your music being recorded and, and getting paid for it all around the world. Um, and that's the basics of how the royalties flow between them. There are some other services that can sit between labels and publishers who help administer and collect various royalties. Um, that's going to be more the domain of the labels and the publishers, so I'm not going to go into it because this is, this is the basics. A um, couple of other things that we should note, and I'm just going to grab my, my text here. There's a couple of codes that are really important, and they are to do with two different areas. There's one that's around this sound recording, and it's called an ISRC code. And there's one on the, um, on the composition side, and it's called an ISWC code. And they are codes that help um, all this music, when it gets into the system, be identified. And you don't really have to worry about them yourselves because they're taken care of by a few different um, places. But this is an international standard across every um, developed music um, territory in the world. Um, so codes never get reused. They're individual for compositions and for sound recordings. Um, the ISRC code is usually assigned by the record label. Um, the code has a prefix that identifies the country and the company who owns it. And then it's just got a bunch of numbers that are unique to that one sound recording. If you had five remixes of a composition, each remix would have its own ISRC code. If you have an edit that is three minutes and another version that's 10 minutes, it will have a different ISRC code because it's a different sound recording. Um, it also helps things like when there's music on something like Spotify, the ISRC code, let's say there's an American release of your song that's been licensed from your Australian label, there'll be two versions up on Spotify. But because they're the same song, they'll both have the same ISRC code. And this is part of the way that someone like Spotify identifies that they're the same song and combines the play count into one play count to give you, you know, all of the American streams and all of the Australian streams as one number next to your record. Um, so they're kind of pretty important. Um, on the composition side, your PRO, which is APRA in Australia, they generate that code for every work you register. And if you happen to check your existing registered work catalogue, you'll actually see those codes somewhere amongst it when you've registered your songs and it will be there. Um, so that kind of covers that. There are There is also a mechanical license in music, which can be um, when somebody wants to make a cover of your composition, you need to get what's called a mechanical license there are companies that are out there that help manage the collection and reporting of royalties from that stuff. Um, Harry Fox Agency is one of those companies in the US, but there's a whole bunch of them around. Um, and just to finish up, there's an area um, between here, services, and all of this income that can be a little bit further defined to give you some ideas about what's going on. And this is the last little bit. So I'll try and move that over so you can read it. But this is like a breakdown of what's happening with services. And instead of um, these things flowing direct, this kind of gets in the middle and it flows from here into here and then out to there. And by that moment, you've got radio, which is pretty straightforward. But as an example, venues are paying a fee to play music and that fee is going to both here and it's going over to here for the sound recording. And again, these two agencies are distributing that money from venues 
based on a whole bunch of different criteria and a, and a shitload of music. You can imagine how much music there is and it's getting divided and it's being paid to the people that these two places pay. So again, really important to be registered. That's also where digital radio pays money to, TV performances, um, online video, on-demand streaming like Spotify also actually pay a performance fee. Um, so that's performance-based um, income. There's also non-performance-based income from downloads and typical old school sales. And the reason there's no, um, there's no performance based on that is obviously, as an example, I go into a shop, I buy a CD, I take it home, I'm listening to it at home, I'm allowed to use it for private use with no further fee. Should I take that CD as a DJ into a club and play it? Then it's gonna start generating this venue revenue that's gonna get paid out of, um, it's going to come in from uh, nightclubs, it's going to come out and it's going to go to the sound recording PRO and the composition performance rights PRO and then it's going to flow out of there to the writer, publisher, artist, performer and record label. So you can see how incredibly important it is to have everything registered with those entities. Um, that's really it as far as where royalties come from, how they're generated, and how they go back to the record label, the artist, performer, the publisher, and the writer. So before we get to some questions, I'm just gonna quickly finish off with a basic summary of royalties that are going from these entities to um, the people that are the artists and the people that are the writers. And based on all these explanations that I've had already, um, the end result is that artists get paid royalties. And these are generally from three places, being your publisher, your label, or your performing rights association. Um, of course, you get paid performance fees for do, doing a DJ gig. You get money for merch and, and money for remixes and stuff like that. But I'm just talking about the royalty side of things. So depending on what your agreement is, and again, this can be completely different for every agreement, which is why I started off with the context of the contracts to start this off. Um, it can be determined by your deals and your contract terms, but the sorts of things that will be in a royalty statement potentially are advances, which is money paid to you up front um, when you sign, which can depend on what level you're at as an artist, whether you even get an advance. Um, and then other things that could be on a royalty statement are recording costs, marketing costs, promotional costs, it really depends whether or not um, they're relevant to the deal that you've done. Sometimes a marketing cost might not be relevant to your royalty. Therefore, it may not even appear on your royalty statement. So you wouldn't even know what's been spent on marketing because it makes no difference to your royalty. So you've got to understand what should and shouldn't be on there. Um, but the important thing is anything that you agree to in an agreement can be taken off your royalties. So if you agree that the backup dancers can be taken off your royalties, guess what? There'll be a $200 fee for Jenny and, and Michael, your backup dancers. If you agree that manager flights can come out of your manager's payments before you get them, they're gonna be there. If you agree that um, flights for promotional people can be there, really, somebody could put anything they want into an agreement, no matter how ridiculous it is. And if you agree to it, they will take the costs out. A classic example of this is US, well, a lot of deals, but particularly the US used to have a clause called a packaging deduction. And it was because they would spend money on the packaging of a CD. Now, CDs aren't even released now, but they will still deduct the packaging deduction because it says in the royalty statement, we can deduct 10% for packaging. Whether or not the packaging costs 10% is not what the royalty clause says. It just says we can deduct it. So it'll be get deducted whether you have packaging or not. I mean, it's crazy, but that's why you've got to realize when you're looking at your royalty statements, the only thing you should be checking because everybody's could be different is what are your agreements? What are the terms that you've agreed to? And are they reflected in my royalty statement? If I've agreed to have a remix recouped from my royalty, is it in there? 
And does it show me how much it is so I can see what's being recouped? These are the things you should be checking when you see a royalty statement. I mean, if you're in a profit share deal like Vicious is, you know, the great thing about a profit share deal is that because effectively everything is recoupable, you see every single cost involved with your record and nothing is hidden. So that's the very upside. Um, some interesting insights to understand, nothing to do with your personal royalty, which is very much relevant to your statement, but as a general vibe of how royalties get paid from these different organisations I've got behind me. Um, most labels pay royalties several times a year. Um, in my experience, normally it's twice yearly for a determined period. So for example, within 90 days of the end of June for the January to June period, publishers can be similar. Um, ROs often pay quarterly like APRA, but PPCA, they pay yearly. They only pay once a year. And again, this is often for a previous period. So when it comes to paying a manager, you'll be paying them generally. And usually it's like within 14 days of you receiving your money. Um, it can be the other way around. And certainly on touring, the touring agent's usually paying you. So it's a little bit different. But again, those things come down to the terms that you agree. Now, the reason that labels and PROs and publishers pay for previous periods and for, and for terms is because they want to set out a term of time that they can calculate all of the income and all of the expenses without that term constantly moving. So they set some time periods in agreements like similar to what I've said. So an, an example of that the fallout of that is that money can take a really long time to come through the system. An example is this. Let's say that a club pays PPCA their music fee for playing music on the 21st of January in 2020. That means that it will fall into the period of July 2019 to July 2020, okay? because PPCA only pay once a year and they pay for an entire year, the gap between the end of that period and when we get paid is when they are working out things like the statements, they're checking registrations with artists and labels, they're generating the reports. And they generally pay that money out in late December 2020 or early January 2021. So, um, you can see there's a significant delay in how long it takes that money to flow through. Um, a record played on July the 1st, 2019, the very first day of the period, you may not receive that money until January 2021. Or if you've got a label that's sharing in that, the label may not see it on a royalty statement until September of 2021. That's a year and nine months after the very, very first play of that record happened. And that is just how it works. Um, it's generally referred to, all of these type of royalties are referred to as pipeline royalties. And the reason they use that term is because it's in the pipe, but it hasn't come out the other end yet into your pocket or the label's pocket or the publisher's pocket. Um, nearly all royalty-based income has some sort of accounting term that applies to it. Spotify have a term where they have to pay their DSP. The DSP has a term where they have to pay the label. The label has a term where they have to pay the artist. And if you've got multiple labels, it's delayed again with another person in between. So you can see how royalties can take a very long time to flow through the pipeline. Um, now there's not much you can do about that situation. No matter what you ask, you know, APRA are not going to change how they account to hundreds of thousands of artists. You can only imagine the size of the royalty statements that they're generating each quarter. Take somebody like Vicious. We account twice yearly, okay? Um, Avicii's last royalty statement had 1,256 PDF pages in it, right? Over 40 lines of data was on each page. So we're talking 
you know, six to 7,000 lines of data that has been accumulated to make that royalty statement. Now, that's only for six months worth of income. And we have to do that every six months for every single artist for the term that we own the record for. So, you know, when somebody says, oh, can, can you just sort out this payment for me? And it falls outside of that guideline. It's incredibly difficult for the entities such as labels, publishers, PROs to change their system for one person or for two people, because then you're potentially getting missed in the next round of royalties and, and, and it's, you know, it's not happening. So, um, you know, some things you just can't do anything about most labels, most publishers, most um, PROs that you deal with, they've got their accounting terms and they're not going to renegotiate those accounting terms. Um, you're going to get, you still get accounted to, you're still going to get paid, but they're probably not going to be very negotiable on those things to do with your, um, your agreement. So look, that is the, um, the ins and outs of, um, of everything to do with, you know, the basics of, um, of copyright, the basics of royalties, how they're generated and, and the basics of contracts. So I'm going to open the, the floor up to any questions. The best way to do that, I think, is uh, if you just type your question in the, in the chat and then, um, and then um, I'll, uh, I'll try and address the question. So Dan here has got, how early should you register your compositions with APRA? And do you need to wait until your master recording is finished? Well, no, you don't need to wait until your master recording is finished. <clears throat> but I think, you know, you, you should have your, um, your, your composition should be kind of complete. If it's, if it's going to have a third party work on it, you know, you could think it's finished and then you could go and talk to your label and they could go, oh, look, you know, I've got a great vocalist for this. And then you're going to have different people um, included in the writing. So, you know, the, the composition is going to change. So I think, you know, um, once you kind of have a fair idea of what the composition is, certainly once you're playing it to a lot of people, you should have um, some inherent registry of it. But, I mean, copyright is it is automatically there from the day you write it. So if there's five people in a room and you play them a song, you know, they're witnesses that you had the song written. Um, even, even though it would be harder to fight in a court if you, if you didn't have it also registered with APRA. Um, from Tim, um, question regarding the, the, hang on, it's just scrolled through there. Regarding the term of a release, what happens when it's after it's done versus perpetuity? I mean, perpetuity is means that the, the copyright is owned by the person who's signed it um, forever. So, you know, if, if, if you own, if you sign a record in perpetuity, you're signing it to that label for the length of its, of its sound recording copyright. Um, obviously, sometimes people license music for terms. Um, the difference between the two, I think, is the investment that the third party people are making in the, in, in the master and the work that they're doing around it. I mean, the issue that I always have with a term is that if we're putting a record out, we're helping you develop it, we're helping you make it, we're helping you release it. If that record becomes a hit, I feel like we should share in that record for the history of its copyright. And if you sign it to a label in perpetuity, every single time they release that record, they have to pay you for it. Otherwise, they're in breach of their contract. On the flip side, if you license somebody a record for a term, when that term expires, you, can get, the, you get the rights to that record back. And then if you were to re-release that same record, you've cut the person out of it who was part of it at the start. So that's where my argument for signing records in perpetuity as a label comes from. On the flip side of that, you might be an artist that makes a record, makes a music video, does the artwork, has your own contact at Spotify to get it playlisted, and your label's doing really nothing. You might even get the remixes done. You might pay for the remixes. 
You might pay for the artwork. You might pay for the mastering. So if you're doing all of that, then maybe a license makes more sense because you're actually funding it. So, you know, there's no right or wrong, but certainly I think it comes down to who's making the record, um, not just creatively, but also financially, and who's having input into how the record's released and promoted that can make a difference on that front. Um, Rory, uh, I have a question. More about the first topic and labels investing in artists. Um, you've said that, but I'm gonna unmute you so you can, uh, you can actually ask me the question because you just said more about, so. Um, yeah, thank you. I, uh, I wrote it down because it was a bit, it's a bit long winded, but it's more um, what you were saying at the start about, um, I kind of took it as labels investing in artists. So as an artist, how important do you feel it is to release consistently with one label as opposed to um, like giving a single here or an EP here? I, th I think, um, yeah, look, to answer that, I think it's a really good question and I think it's a balance between the two. And I would even give an example of my own personal DJ career, right? I have done about four residencies on a Saturday night in 25 years. I invested in those clubs and I committed to One Love and I said to anybody that wanted me to work in Melbourne on a Saturday night for nine years, I said, no. I said, I work at One Love, I've committed to them. And because I committed to them, they committed to me and pushed me really hard and took me interstate and I mixed CDs for them. And so I think with labels, having said that, I didn't commit to One Love for every night of the week. I still had the ability to do other things, but I did still have a commitment to them. So I think a, a great way, if you do make a lot of music, if you don't make a lot of music, I think you're better off having one deal and one artist name. I think you get more out of it. You get more commitment from the label. You know where you stand. You find the right label. They back you to the hilt and you're only pushing one artist name. If you're really prolific at making music, you can spread it around and there are advantages to that. And labels such as us, we, we get that and we like an artist to release with other networks, provided they're different to our network. There can be definitely advantages in that because obviously you can spread your network and then suddenly, you know, if we've got an artist signed to Vicious and we've got a commitment to four or five records and in between that commitment, they can also make a record for Defected Mm -hmm. That defected spreads their brand name. It helps them gain more fans. And that means the next release they do with Vicious is better because it's yeah. got a greater audience exposed to it. Um, I'm going to mute you again, um, Rory. But does that kind of cover the basics of... I think, I think you can have a balance where you have... I think it's great to have a team that are committed to you and want to push your music and that you're long-term committed to them. Yeah. And I think you need to do deals if you're a prolific music writer that allows you to do some things in and around that with third parties and with opportunities that come up. But I still think you want somebody on your team long term that you can plan with that isn't fickle about, oh, do I like this song or where does, it, you know, you might deliver a more underground song. And if you're signing one off records, you know, it may not get released because you've got no one backing it long term but if you've got somebody backing you long term you can put an underground record out and then you can have a more commercial record after it because you know that you've got more music coming from from that person you know um and if you take a really short-term approach labels are going to be less likely to commit the same with publishers the same with managers so i think it's a balance between um what you're trying to achieve which is the ability to not miss out on an opportunity, I guess, to um, grow the network of labels and producers and collaborations that you can do. But at the same time, having somebody on your team permanently. So I guess it's kind of trying to find a balance between those two. Sure. Um, from Paul Janisich, are there any royalties with social media um, um, with social media, yes, there are. And they, again, come through down here, these performance-based um, areas. So 
on-demand streaming, on-demand um, things like YouTube. They have an advertising base royalty um, with them. The same with Facebook, labels do deals and um, you get paid through them. I mean, the royalty rate from YouTube is tiny in comparison to just about any other format. I mean, if you're driving people to listen to your music, you don't want to be sending them to YouTube. You probably want to be sending them to Spotify or iTunes or one of the big DS, sorry, one of the big services. Um, YouTube's royalty rate is tiny and they're so powerful that thus far the music industry as a whole hasn't been able to, um, to, do, anything, to do anything about that. A couple more questions. <clears throat> um, how often, would, this is from Arden, how often would labels use remix recoup offerings over rights and master points for remixes on that version? Um, it's something that's come up more recently and it depends on the remixer. Um, I think, you know, you have to be open to it um, and it depends on the size and the fee. Um, if you're a big artist with a huge following, as an example on Spotify, and let's just say Calvin Harris, if Calvin Harris's re remix is a record, you're instantly getting engaged with his entire Spotify audience of 167 million or whatever it is. I don't, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but, you know, and should he just get a flat fee for that? I don't know. I mean, there's no right or wrong, but we've certainly had many occasions where we've given up shares in, um, in remixer um, royalties for just those versions. And you can do a calculation, you know, of what that version would have to do as far as business to equal a certain amount of money. So one of the things you can just work out is, okay, you know, and I'll just grab my calculator here just quickly, but um, let's say Spotify is generating about um, 0.005 cents, um, 0.005 cents per stream. I can times that by 1 million and it equals five grand, right? And that's the gross royalty, roughly. So that means that as an artist, you're getting back two and a half grand and the label's getting two and a half grand. So if the remixer, if his fee is seven and a half grand normally, and he says to you, I'll do it for a thousand bucks plus 50% of the royalty, that means that version has to stream four million or more before you're behind. So you can work this stuff out and you can put a value on sharing that royalty and it will come back and you can go, is this feasible? You know, um, is my song, you know, and it, again, if you're a new artist and Calvin Harris is remixing you, it's a much easier thing to go. Well, obviously Calvin Harris brings, a, you know, a lot of, um, a, a lot to the, to the game, flip it on its head. You're not going to get a share of Calvin Harris's royalty when you're an unknown remixer and he's already got 169 million fans. So, you know, it, that really just comes down to the power of the remixer, how badly the artist and the label want to put that remixer on. But I think it's reasonable to consider it because it means that you get better remixes on your music, you know? And that's like I said earlier, rather than selling their service, they're actually kind of um, having it, they're, they're getting a stake they're asking for a stake in the future of their version. And as long as it's their version only, it's fairly justifiable. But again, it just depends what the, um, on the, on the rate. Um, just got a quick question here from Christian. Why um, American radio doesn't pay royalties to the performing artist? Uh, they don't pay anything to anyone. It sucks. And it's been like that forever. They just lobbied way back that, Radio was a promotional tool. Um, they got it across the line with the societies that look after how that money is paid and with the people who look after broadcasting in the USA, and it has never changed. Um, new school radio, digital radio like Sirius XM over there, which is pretty big, um, they do have to pay performance royalties, but traditional what they call terrestrial radio never have and probably are unlikely to ever do so. Um, I'm gonna take a few more here. Um, Arden, brand recognition with a commitment to your label and releases as a question mark. 
well, I guess, um, do you mean brand recognition from the, I'll try and find you here and unmute you. Do you want to just clarify your question a, a little a little bit, Arden? Hi, John. I was just trying to basically get to, if you commit, like you were saying with One Love, if you commit to your label and say you're doing club nights as well, it's better to focus on your single label. And if you're going out to another label, like you were saying, as example, is defected. Um, you do separate different releases for that label. So maybe two different artist names, or is it better to keep one artist name and do specific genres of music for a number label? Um, I mean, look, I don't think there's any one correct answer. Um, certainly, you know, you can also do deals that include touring and you can make it part of, of, of your deal. So a brand like Defected obviously has, you know, their Defected touring and they have Glitterbox as well. So if you're making music, you potentially may take a lesser royalty because you might include in your deal that you need to be on their gigs. Now, their gig fee may be less than what you would get if you did a gig. Let's say you negotiate, you know, to play on defected festivals as part of your deal with defected records. You know, you might get a different fee, a higher fee, if you played on another festival in Ibiza and the next day you played on Defected because Defected might do a deal and they say, well, you know, the upside is that you've now got 10 nights in Ibiza for the summer. The downside is we're not going to pay you what you would get paid to do 10 independent nights because we're doing a group kind of deal. So all of that stuff can be included and you've just got to weigh the positives and the negatives. There are 360 deals out there, what they call, that incorporate every element of an artist's career. I believe that Robbie Williams did one with EMI where EMI have a share of his concert ticketing, they have a share of his merch, they have a share of his publishing, they have a share of his master rights, everything. As I understand it, I'm not 100% sure, but that's the basis of a 360 deal. So anything's on the table, you've just got to work out whether it works for you. And obviously with a lot of this stuff, it's, you've got to ask yourself not just what happens when it's working, but what happens when it doesn't work? Because sometimes deals don't work. So if a deal doesn't work and you're in a 360 deal, every single element of where you earn money is fucked. Everything is tied up, you know? So sometimes it can be good to have your publishing in a different basket to your record label because you've got different networks. And when one thing slows down, the other one could provide could be providing opportunities. And again, it's a horses for courses thing. You may be able to take an artist's name and have it be exclusive to one person. Um, and you may be able to have another artist's name that is doing something somewhere else at the same time, depending on how you structure your deals, you know, it's completely possible. Um, just a couple more. Sorry, I'm just trying to... Um, get through these questions before we finish up. Um, from um, from Jaden, what are your thoughts on releasing with major labels like Universal and Sony if you're not strictly making club music? Um, look, every every label from, an, we went over this a little bit in the A&R, every label from the smallest to the biggest has pros and cons. And it's how you fit into that and what you need at what time. If you're a brand new artist, I'm not sure that being with a major label is the best place to develop and grow because you're competing with huge artists that are already there. I mean, there's some great A&R people within major labels that are, that are good at development, but a lot of development is done by independent labels or it's done by labels that are sitting underneath majors. Um, Black Butter is a great example out of the UK, awesome label found Rudimental, found Gorgon City, but they upstream into a major when it's required. Um, and there's lots of examples like that. So there's no right or wrong answer. If you've got an A&R person um, that absolutely loves what you do and they work for a major label and they want to put a deal on the table, you're certainly going to look at it and potentially it could be great. But you've got to think, you know, what happens if that A&R person gets sacked next week? You know, Andy gave an example a couple of weeks ago of a guy who signed a deal out of America. He signed it with a UK label 
flew over to the UK to meet them for the first week, got there, and the three people he'd been dealing with had all been sacked. And not one person within the company basically knew what he was doing, what he was making, anything, you know. So with an independent label, a lot of the time, labels like Vicious, labels like Defected, labels like Tool Room, you know, um, Diplo's label, that you know, they're all owned by the people that have owned them for, you know, we've had Vicious for over 25 years, myself and Andy. There's been a couple of other people involved at various times, but the people who have been driving the business has been myself and Andy. So when you're signing to Vicious, you're kind of signing to us um, and to the people who work for us. And we ain't going to get sacked. Um, and I guess, you know, that's what you've got to think when you're signing with a, with a major or an independent. Um, in terms of things like the ARIA club chart and performance reports, is there any overlap between APRA and PPCA in payments made or are they each only exclusive to one side? Yeah, they're exclusive to one side. So they're covering the same thing, performance, but one is for, as we went back up here, for the composition and one is for the sound recording. APRA only collect money for the composition and PPCA only collect money for the master right, the, perfor the um, performance of the sound recording. But they are in the same building. And I'm sure that they talk to each other and they cross collateralize and look at, you know, income from the same venue to see if it's the same. I'm sure they talk to each other, but they don't mix the pools of money. And they in fact even collect in different ways and use different tools, um, PPCA, um, use listening boxes, they use the club chart, they use Kuvo, and the, sorry, they use club chart DJ returns, they use Kuvo, they use listening boxes, and they use dance radio, PPCA, I mean, um, APRA, as I understand it, use performance reports from live, from live venues, and they use radio, so they use slightly different things. There may be other things they use as well, so, um, yeah, but they're completely different sides of the uh, coin. Um, any chance of getting a photo of the whiteboard? Well, there's your chance. Um, I think that's got everything in it. You take a, I don't know if I can make this, is that full screen for everybody? So you can grab a photo of that and that should cover it. I mean, if you actually look up online, um, um, music business, music business royalties, you'll see lots of flows similar to this. Some of them are more intricate. Obviously, when you get talked through it, it makes a little bit more sense, but um, there's lots of, lots of online things um, that you can um, kind of do. Look, we might leave it at that, everybody. Thanks again for your time. Great to have you in here. Um, Look forward to hearing your music through the rest of the year. Hopefully we're back in clubs and doing stuff pretty soon. Um, and obviously um, this is the last of our four. All of these are going up on YouTube so you can watch them again in the future. Um, and I'm getting a bit uh, rasp here. One quick thing just to finish off. Um, these guys at Red Bull have kindly um, given us some giveaways to anybody who's in these chats. So I'm going to paste a link into the chat room right now. And if you click on this link, but please do it quickly because it's going to, um, uh, hang on, is that the right one? Yes. So if you click on that link or copy it, you can um, register to get yourself, if you're in Australia, sent some Red Bull, courtesy of um, the Red Bull team. So it's nice for them to get, on, get involved. They're very proactive in um, the music field and, and we're happy to get, oh, somebody got sent some already. Nice one, Christian, awesome. Um, yeah, so all of these will be up on YouTube, um, the Vicious Recordings YouTube. So check them out there if you want to recap on anything. And all the best with your music. And I look forward to hearing some stuff over the next uh, few months and years off all of you. Cheers. Good night.